Welcome. Welcome to the GLOBE Conference, ladies and gentlemen. It is our honor to kick off the early morning session, so thank you all for being here and thank you for your attention. And before I get into my prepared remarks, there is a, just a brief announcement that uh, the GRI recently hired a new director of their North American operations, and if he's here, Eric Israel. Uh, Eric, oh, here we are, terrific. I'd just like to say Eric is going to be the leader of our North American effort here uh, for the GRI. He'll be based in New York. Eric has a very strong background in auditing and, su and the sustainability fields, both at PwC and KPMG, and so I'm very thrilled that, that he's joining the GRI. And uh, so a wonderful addition to our North American focal point. With that, I'd like to say it's an absolute pleasure to be here today. Not just because this is the first time that I've had the opportunity to speak here in this beautiful city, but because it's the first time the GRI, the Global Reporting Initiative, has helped shape the sessions here at GLOBE. And it's the first time that GLOBE has actually dedicated sessions to how sustainability is becoming a truly mainstream business issue. And today, I'd like to give you my perspective as chairman of the Global, of the global Reporting Initiative and someone who has spent over three decades as a global institutional investor. And I'd like to begin my remarks by first talking not about the United States, where I'm from, and not about Canada, where we are, but about China. Last month, The Economist reported how new rules from the government agency will require 15,000 companies in China to make real-time public disclosures on emissions of air pollutants, wastewater, and heavy metals. 15,000 companies. And while it may seem paradoxical to some that the Chinese government is going to such lengths to promote transparency, with water unfit to drink and air unfit to breathe, they increasingly have no choice. The new rules underline three things in particular. First, an understanding by the Chinese government that the status quo is untenable. Resource scarcity, energy demands, the fight against corruption, the list goes on. All are shaping the thinking at the highest levels. And that means one thing, action. And action means policy. Second, and building on the point of policy, it illustrates that there is today an understanding that transparency, in this case, the disclosure of specific environmental information and corporate performance are interlinked. And third, it underlines that the drive for corporate transparency spans otherwise very distinct economic, political, and legal systems. Also last month, but this time in Europe, a draft European Union directive moved one very important step closer to becoming law across 28 member states. Why is this of such significance, not least here in North America? Well, it is anticipated that this will be an important catalyst for increasing the numbers of organizations globally that are required to disclose non-financial information. Under the EU directive, it is likely that all companies with over 500 employees will be required to publish annual statements with information on their impacts on the environment, society, employees, and human rights, risks associated with their activities, and descriptions of their business models and diversity policies. That means an estimated 6,000 companies in the world's largest economy and trading area fundamentally changing how they report. In short, whether it is in London, Berlin, Brussels, the message is increasingly the same. If you want to do business in Europe, you're going to have to be transparent. And it's not just China and the EU. In South Africa, since 2010, it has been a listing requirement at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange to produce an integrated report. And by that, I mean a report that integrates standard financial information that companies are obliged to report and make public with non-financial or sustainability information. And the list goes on from government policies in India and Australia to stock exchanges 
initiatives in Sao Paulo and New York. Indeed, last year, the GRI published a report that revealed 180 different transparency and sustainability initiatives across 45 different regions and countries. All are different. Some are sector specific, others nationwide. Some were mandatory, others voluntary. What they all had in common, however, is that they are changing not just what businesses report, but how they do business. And I probably don't need to tell you that a little over a decade ago, the world was very different. Indeed, there was no GRI. Corporate reporting was simply reams of numbers of financial statements. A tiny handful of companies did choose back then, for example, on an individual basis to disclose more than the P&L. But there was no consistency, no comparability, no real understanding about what the information meant and who it was for. Fast forward 15 years, and according to the KPMG study that came out late last year, 90% of the G250, the largest 250 companies in the world, disclose now non-financial information, of which over 80% refer to GRI's sustainability reporting guidelines. KPMG's figures for the largest 100 companies in Canada are also very promising. 83% of the 100 largest companies in Canada now produce a corporate responsibility report of some form or another. That is the ninth highest figure for any country in the world. Over three quarters of those are actually GRI guidelines and referenced, referencing GRI. And the volume of those reports, just to put it in perspective, is up well over 100% from five years ago, not just on the number of sustainability reports, but the number referencing GRI. The overall figure worldwide runs into the thousands, and it's not just companies. For example, the Port of Vancouver is a GRI reporter, which I'm told handles cargo worth over 75 billion Canadian dollars. The city of Chicago, the Port of LA, the US Army, the London Olympics, they're all GRI reporters. A whole host of organizations and public entities, not just companies around the world, are all producing sustainability reports. And all of these are some examples of, of some of the GRI reports. But why is the corporate reporting landscape changing rapidly? And what are the implications for everyone here today and those beyond the conference hall? Three dynamics in particular are transforming the environment in which businesses operate in an irreversible way. Technology, governments, and investors. And I'd like to touch on each briefly. First, technological change. It's no surprise to anybody in the room here who has children texting them probably daily that the internet has fundamentally changed how we do business and how we communicate. It has sparked a data revolution that has transformed people's outlook and changed how they think. The amount of data made available in the last two years exceeds that of the rest of history put together. From tweets about the weather to Facebook likes, much of this information, of course, lies somewhere in between the mundane and the meaningless. But the advent of having all this information in the public domain has fundamentally changed expectations about what companies disclose about themselves and how they do it. Ask the, tw the, the average 25-year-old whether they think the information about a company's impact on society, the environment, should be made public. And the response is most likely a quizzical look. Why? Well, because it isn't a question to them. It's an imperative, of course. They view the world differently. They look at companies, at you, differently. Social media and technology have permanently altered the social license for companies to operate and become the new check and balance on business, especially large corporations, accelerating what people commonly think of as public oversight. Let's touch on governments for a minute. Policies set by governments and stock exchanges reflect the rising public consciousness about environmental and social issues and increasing public demand for transparency. But governments are not just increasingly active in this space on an individual country, or in this case, even the, the European Union, on a regional basis. The sustainability development agenda is also changing at the global and multilateral level. 
Next year, the United Nations Millennium Development Goals will be replaced by a new set of goals called Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. The post-2015 Sustainable Development Agenda may not have hit the headlines of the Wall Street Journal or CNN, but these goals are being discussed by national governments, civil society organizations, and business, and will increasingly shape the policymaking and thinking at a national and global level. While the final goals are not yet defined, what we do know is that they will lead to an increased role and responsibility on business to contribute to a sustainable world. Businesses will only be able to do this, however, if they measure, monitor, and manage their performance with regard to the Sustainable Development Goals. And last September, at the UN Global Compact Leaders Summit in New York, the UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched a joint initiative between the GRI, the UN Global Compact, and the World Business Council for, for Sustainable Development, led by Peter Bacher, who's actually here to my right, who is not just a friend of the GRI, but a leading thinker on many things sustainability. I'm happy to say he's here today to be on our panel in the next session. Our shared goal between the GRI, the UN Global Compact, and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development is to bring an alignment among the key partners to provide private sector guidance to enhance companies' sustainability management and reporting. Let's talk about investors briefly. I want to share my thoughts with you as somebody who has managed performance-based capital on a global basis and also managed one of the largest equity portfolios in the world, that of the Public Employee Retirement System of California. And I take particular heart in the interest that stock exchanges are taking in sustainability disclosure. When I began my career in, 19, in the 1980s, next to no one gave much thought to the wider economic, environmental, or social and governance performance and impact on companies. The information simply wasn't available, and even if it had been, people would not have known really how to interpret it or use it. And today, many stock exchanges are across the world now require listed companies to disclose non-financial information. The latest benchmarking of sustainable stock exchanges by the Toronto publication Corporate Nights lists 45 different exchanges across the world, all with either voluntary or mandatory requirements for disclosure of ESG, environmental, social, and governance information. While the exchanges here in North America in particular, New York and Toronto, trail those of Europe and the Far East. The general direction of travel is clear. More transparency, higher standards, better quality reporting, and better comparability. Note that the World Federation of, Sh of Exchanges just yesterday listed 11 more exchanges that have joined their sustainability development group and working group with a mandate to build consensus around ESG disclosure. Now, reflecting on my experience with investment firms, I've had good fortune to see firsthand that investment firms perform better with robust investment processes that incorporate into their modeling non-financial factors, such as responsible supply chain management, robust employee retention processes, and sustainable environment policies, just to name a few. Indeed, my own experience is borne out in the research by Deutsche Bank, which shows that using best-in-class investment processes which capture this kind of information end up with superior risk-adjusted returns in 89% of the studies examined. But perhaps the most significant progress, in my opinion, in the last few years has been the leadership among the largest pension plans in the world. So a group comprising of about a dozen of these of the largest pension plans in the world, including APG of the Netherlands, CalPERS, the superannuation funds of Australia, and Ontario teachers, among others, now have demonstrated leadership in requiring their investment managers to integrate ESG into their investment processes. Increasingly, these institutions the largest in the world, are requiring their investment managers, and I don't just mean public equity managers, but private equity managers and other asset classes to demonstrate how they integrate ESG into the investment process. And I think that is a very powerful force. While not all investors are clamoring for this right now, as an institutional investor, I can tell you that this is the way of the future, 
and business needs to be ready for it. Evidence also in the investment world can be seen by looking at shareholder proposal activity. Over the last 12 months in North America, there have been a record number and an increase of over 50% of shareholder resolutions filed on, on environmental and social concerns. My prediction here is that over the next 10 years, the level of shareholder activism on environmental and social issues will be dramatic and may indeed rival the level of activism we saw on corporate governance in the post-Enron and post-WorldCom era. It demonstrates that the increased level of awareness and concern investors have for corporate bad behavior will come in many forms. The power of shareholder resolutions is rising dramatically, and incidentally, we saw some of this last week with Exxon. And we know that nobody wants to be on the receiving end of this kind of activism. So the drivers of the rise in sustainability that I've outlined so far, be they all external, are technology, governments, investors, but those are all external demands. For companies, sustainability reporting is about far more than that. It is about an internal strategic exercise, a means to learn more about businesses and the environment in which it operates, and to gain a competitive edge in today's markets. By compiling a sustainability report, a company learns more about itself in order, to, in order so to do that, they, so they can measure and monitor its performance and its impacts in a way it may never have considered. And the GRI sustainability reporting guidelines list over 100 different indicators. Let me just talk about two or three here. One might be energy consumption within and outside an organization. Another would be significant risk of incidents of child labor. Another would be the number and rates of new employees and employee turnover by age, gender, region, and also the negative human rights impacts of, in the supply chain. Organizations are required to make an assessment of which of these indicators is most material or relevant. And it is impossible to make these determinations without looking at business in a completely different way with a different perspective. Early feedback on G4, which is the fourth generation of the GRI's, indicate, GRI's uh, guidelines, and its focus on materiality, show that sustainability reporting now requires interaction from not just the sustainability reporting staff, but others throughout the C-suite, finance, operations, risk, internal audit, for example. Increasingly, sustainability metrics need to be supported by consistent processes, dependable systems, internal control, and third-party assurance that provide confidence in the information that is being reported. The ultimate objective is reporting that integrates sustainability and social responsibility with financial goals and results in a description of what stakeholders look at and will and we'll view as the past and future creation of value as a company. So aside from the rapid growth in sustainability reporting in the last decade, perhaps the other most significant development is the improved quality of the reports themselves and the data that they provide. So as an investor, the quality and integrity of data is absolutely critical. I can tell you that just as high quality financial reporting underpins the integrity of global financial mar markets, the same goes for sustainability reporting if we are to move to integrated reporting. As such, external assurance in non-financial reporting, in my opinion, is critical to the successful integration of financial and non-financial information. And for those who believe that integrated reporting the combination of the two, that is financial and non-financial, if integrated reporting is the end game, I would remind you that there can be no integrated reports without something to integrate. Sustainability reporting is a prerequisite for an integrated report. The strength of the GRI guidelines is that they are designed specifically to align with other measures and methodologies, and GRI has become the benchmark for sustainability reporting and how 
uh, an important, and is now actually a very important keystone for future reporting models. In conclusion, I would just sum up and say that the external forces of technology, public policy, and investors leave corporations with little choice in moving towards greater transparency in sustainability reporting. The next generation and the world of 2020, 2030, and beyond will demand this. More so, however, the internal benefits of non-financial reporting are immense for the company in its development of financial goals and its ability to communicate its historic and future sources of value creation, along with enhanced transparency and a better understanding of information impacting business performance will come better informed assessments of long-term business prospects and improved access to capital markets.